get something to pop up on the screen, like recording in pro progress. Um, we we're recording this session because there are a number of people who wanted to be on it who uh, weren't able to be here tonight. So, um, and secondly, um, after, after the conversation with Joan that Brandon and I will have, then there is a chat function and we invite you to direct your chats to Brandon and to me. Uh, and we'll sort through those and ask those. It's a little bit easier than people raising their hands or um, raising their virtual hands or whatever uh, to do that. So we'll go for about an hour, a little over an hour perhaps, depending on how the conversation goes. I do know that you've got, we've got some people tuning in from Eastern Daylight Time, which means it's a little after nine. <laughs> so we're, we're in all different kinds of time zones across the, across the country. But it is wonderful to welcome all of you to this. And Joan, thank you very much for making this time and for witnessing to these issues as a person of faith for, several, for many decades. You are an example. You and Margaret and others are examples to the rest of us. Oh, one last thing before we start, for those of you who are affiliated or have been affiliated with Yale, um, Jeffrey and Ann Rothorn were to be on the call, um, but um, they, um, and for those of you who don't know, Jeffrey was a professor of liturgy and the director of the Institute of Sacred Music at Yale Divinity School when many of us, when some of us were students there. Um, and he's also a very good friend. They are very good friends of the United Church of yeah, Santa Fe. Um, Jeffrey had his 88 and he yeah. fell yesterday. And the combination of that plus Parkinson's made for a very difficult surgery. Um, he badly, he broke his hip badly. So please keep Jeffrey and Ann um, in your prayers in this time as, as well. So I know that they would want to, they were certainly looking forward to being a part or being engaged in this conversation tonight. So please keep Jeffrey and Ann Rothorn in, in your prayers. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, so Joan, uh, we've uh, introduced ourselves. Um, uh -huh. So um, that's, um, we wanted to hear from someone who was directly involved with Griswold versus the state of Connecticut. But as we do that, what, can you give us some basic background? Where did you grow up? Um, how did you end up going to Yale Divinity School starting in 1950 when there were only 10 women in your class? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then sort of how did things evolve from that? I mean, you weren't planning on going into uh, ministry and you were gonna do radio or TV broadcasting, right? At the very beginning. <laughs> Okay. But it moved, it moved on to campus ministry eventually, but when the, after my call to ministry came. Yeah, I grew up in Chatham, New Jersey, um, nice, innocent little town in Jersey, um, and eventually had a call to the ministry and decided um, to go to Yale Divinity School, and somebody um, said to me, you'll never get in, you know, they only take 10 women a year, um, which in those days, this is 1950, um, I was fortunate enough to be one of the 10. Um, and, and the Dean came down to visit, I have to throw this one in just because it fits with. It's important. With, with the, yeah, the time. Um, the Dean came down to Dean Pope, bless his heart, wonderful man, to welcome us all there. About the second week we were there, we had to live off campus, couldn't live on the quad, parish forbid we should live near the boys. Um, so we were a couple blocks away. 301 prospect and he welcomed us told us how they had worked very hard to decide which women to accept and uh, made a very hard decision and we were very special to have been let in and they were very glad to have us here it was very important that we focus on our work and that we not get distracted but that we finish our program because after all, they had kept 10 very fine young men out who could have been training for the ministry. And they'd kept them out to let us in. So we had better come through and get our degree. <clears throat> and I'm happy to say that nine of our 10 made it all the way to graduation. Um, one made it to two years of the three and then married the president of the class that was graduating and went <laughs> on her way. Um, so. That's sort of what late Yale was like in 1950, um, in the early days. When, when I arrived and was invited by Colin Williams to come 
work at Yale after a young, a, a woman student who came to Yale Divinity School confronted Colin one day on the campus and said, Dean Williams, I came here to learn how to be a minister and it would be a, be a woman minister. And how am I supposed to do that? You don't have any women on the faculty around here. What am I supposed to do? And he's, fortunately Colin had three daughters so he knew a lot. So he said, <laughs> you're right. And I um, knew I had an invitation to come aboard. It wasn't quite clear all of what I was supposed to do but I think I was supposed to be, represent the fact that there could be women in ministry. When my very first day and I'm coming there and at the faculty conference has started, there was Margaret Farley and we started together. And um, I have treasured her friendship and support ever since all the way through. We were kind of, um, we were outnumbered in those days at the, at the Div School faculty. Um, anyway, I'm, okay, now I've gotten distracted. So, so going back to, to so you started YDS in 1950, um, and then you happened to meet a um, you happened to meet another student by the name of Bob Forsberg. Ah, yes. And what happened then? Well, my call was to campus ministry. I fell in love with the campus radical, whose call was to work with the poor. He had already moved off. He was a year ahead of me. He'd already moved off of the beautiful Divinity School campus and was living down on Oak Street in the tenements down there. Um, and so I joined him in his ministry, I finished my degree um, and we were both ordained um, and for a number of years worked in, in the inner city in a group ministry in the inner city and in the Oak Street area and in the housing projects and whatnot. Um, and then eventually I got the call to come work at the Div School and behold, I was in what had felt like my calling uh, for all those years, for which I was very grateful. Um, and let's see, do we launch into the family life part and the? Sure. So you got married in 1950, 1952. You got ordained in 1953. Perfect. Moved into the inner city of New Haven to do this group ministry. Um, but you were married, and you you and Bob wanted to have kids. Where did the family planning thing come into? Well, I mean, who? What was your hired, introduction? What was your introduction to family planning? Was that something a professor told you, or well, who, told, who, who talked with you first about family planning? Oh, my knowledgeable mother, who was very helpful. <laughs> uh, mothers very often do the sex talk, but she also was very big on on the whole family planning thing, and and uh, so that was very helpful. But I grew up in New Jersey, where in fact you could get some contraceptive help in those days. I got married in Connecticut. And Connecticut and Massachusetts in 1950 were the last two states where the Comstock law was still in effect. The Comstock law forbade the use of contraception for anybody, couples, single couples, married couples, anybody, contraception, illegal, no go. In fact, somebody, one of the lawyers had quipped that in Connecticut, you would need policemen under every married bed in the state of Connecticut to enforce the law. It was very awkward because it meant you couldn't, if, well, for people who had money and could afford a private uh, OBGYN, I'm sure those women were able to get some help with family planning. The pill wasn't in existence yet. It was um, diaphragms or other forms of contraception. So as we planned to get married, I thought, well, I've got to find somewhere to find a doctor. Um, and I heard about that Planned Parenthood had a clinic down over the Connecticut line into Porchester, New York, an hour away in Porchester. And so three Div School couples who were all planning to get married uh, took a day and went down for a program that Planned Parenthood had of sort of a pre-marriage program. And we spent the day, they had counseling on uh, financial things. They had counseling, uh, individual sort of psychological, a little bit counseling on conflict and whatnot, things you could talk about. And they um, had the possibility of, of uh, choosing some form of contraception uh, before you got married and, and whatnot. So I was very fond of Planned Parenthood in Porchester, New York, because it was very, helpful, whereas the state of Connecticut was a problem. Um, 
so I, I continued then um, going routinely down to Fort Chester when I needed checkups and whatnot. And after a while in, in the inner city where we lived, every now and then I would have a neighbor say to me, how come you ain't pregnant yet? How come you, you're going to slip? You're going to have, I said, no, we're planning our family. It's going to be a couple of years. Oh, you'll stub your toe. You'll, I said, no, there are things you can do. Well, yeah, but none of them work, she said. I said, well, I know a doctor. I go see a doctor down at Planned Parenthood who's helped. Can I go with you? She said, the result of that was that for several years, I had a van load of my neighbors who asked to go with me, um, going down every few months to Port Chester, driving down the highway over the line to safe New York State where we could see the doctor, get contraceptive help and come back across the state line into Connecticut. And it was always um, a joke on the way home. Somebody would look out the back window and say, the cops following us yet? Are the cops following us yet? Because we were so aware of the illegality of what we were doing, which was so ridiculous actually, but it was still illegal. Um, so it was illegal. It was, a, you, could buy con you could buy contraception down in New York, but you couldn't use it. In theoretically, Canada. yeah, theoretically, you shouldn't use it after you brought it home. Couldn't use it in Connecticut or Massachusetts. So um, <laughs> now, the, the, every um, every couple of years, um, some of the Protestant clergy would go up to Hartford to try to change, get the late law changed at the Hartford um, at the legislature. At, at the legislature. Connecticut and Massachusetts were the only two that still had this Comstock law. Well, so they would they would make their speeches and about why the law should be changed. And, so, and of course, there were many very devout and friendly Roman Catholic legislators there in Connecticut. And they would remind the folks who came to make the case that it was in fact an evangelical Protestant who had put the Comstock law in on the books and had across the country. And he had been really rabid on the subject. And they said, since, since one of your group was for the law and put it on the books, we can't very well take it off. <laughs> and so it didn't get removed that way, um, legally from that way. And so it was that eventually Planned Parenthood decided to challenge the law <clears throat> and fight it in the courts, take it to the court. And um, Estelle Griswold, um, opened a clinic, a Planned Parenthood clinic in New Haven, Connecticut on Trumbull Street um, in, in 1961. Um, it was open Monday, Wednesday, Friday. The first week I saw a notice of it in the newspaper and said, aha, called, made an appointment, went on Wednesday night, um, saw the doctor, saw Mrs. Griswold, and on my way, way out the door, I said to Mrs. Griswold, it's really nice that you have opened the clinic and are having this service for us here in Connecticut because it's a long drive to Port Chester and we're really glad for this. And I said, <laughs> sort of offhandedly, I said, if there's anything I can do to help, let me know. And she said, well, thank you, Joan. And I, I went on home. Um, that so was so when, when who, who, who was Estelle Griswold? Estelle Griswold. Well, she was the head of Planned Parenthood in Connecticut and had been working with them a very long time. And she was, she was a lively dynamo. Um, so that was Wednesday night. On Friday, the clinic was open that first week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. I was there Wednesday. On Friday, the clinic was open Friday and the police came. Uh, they raided the place. They went all through it. They arrested Mrs. Griswold and Dr. Buxton. They closed the clinic down there and the flashlights of the reporters that it was a big hoop to do about closing down this brand new Planned Parenthood clinic on Friday. Um, I said, oh my goodness, this is what they wanted. They wanted to be able to test the law. Saturday morning, my phone rang. It was Estelle Griswold. I said, Estelle, how nice to hear from you. Are you out of jail? She said, oh yes, I'm out of jail. And she said, you said the other night, if there was anything you could do to help, let me let you let me know. And she said, there's something you can do to help. <laughs> and I said, uh, yes. <laughs> what did you have in mind? 
And she said, we need you to turn state's evidence and help us go to court with this case. And I said, you want me to turn state's evidence on you and Dr. Buxton? She said, that's right. That's the only way we're gonna get this case to the Supreme Court and get rid of the law. I said, okay. I said, can I keep my, my pills? By this time there were, there were birth control pills, uh, which was sort of new. And she said, yes, yes, we'll get, you'll have to give your supply to the policeman when he talks to you, but we'll give you some more. So we were off and running on, on the court case at that point, which I had not anticipated, but it was okay. <laughs> so what was, so what was it? So you were a witness for the prosecution. You well, the state you, was prosecuting. I we were defending against. You were defending. Okay, you were. Yeah, yeah right, right. Against. So, uh, what was it like on the witness stand? Well, when we went to court, actually, um, there were three women that the Planned Parenthood had asked to be to testify and to be witnesses. Um, I was one. There was a young British woman who was a student at the School of Public Health. Um, she was a married student and she'd come from England and she had found her way to Planned Parenthood uh, clinic. And the third one was a young woman who worked at the Dixwell Community House in the neighborhood I lived in. Um, and she and her husband wanted some help with family planning and she had come to Planned Parenthood. So the three of us were there in court um, and one by one were called up to the stand to be questioned and to, um, to testify that we had indeed gone to the clinic. We had in the Mrs. Um, the Dr. Buxton had indeed examined and, and uh, prescribed. Um, the Mrs. Griswold had counseled us. Um, it was it was really I'd never been a witness in court before. I remember being very concerned about what I ought to wear. I wore a very demure dress with little buttons down the front and tried to look like a proper minister's wife. Um, and um, and you chaired the, some of the questions they, the, that the prosecution asked you were somewhat asinine. Well, some were very just sort of factual and stuff. Um, at the very beginning, he asked, um, about my family, did I have children? Yes, I have a husband and I have several children and I went into all of that. Um, we went all through, at the very end of the questions, he walked back and forth in front of me, silently sort of pacing back and forth, stopped dead in front of me, looked at me and said, are you married? And I was sort of taken aback um, and said demurely as I could, yes, I'm married. <laughs> And he said, that's all, and he went and sat down. I never heard any more from him or about what happened with the testimony, but um, the other two people, women also were asked to, to testify and I've forgotten how they were treated on the stand. But the point was for us to lose the case in New Haven. Um, Mrs. Griswold explained to me, we wanna lose in New Haven and then we, because we want to take it to Hartford and we have to do the case, try it at the state level. And then we want to lose it at the state level so that we can take it to the Supreme Court. And in fact, that's what happened. They eventually went to the Supreme Court. And at that point, several of the law, uh, faculty from the law school helped out, kind of got aboard with the case. And, and the, the case went to, to what I did not. We the, we, the three women who had testified in New Haven only spoke in New Haven. We didn't get to go to the rest of the um, festivities all the way, but I followed it. I followed it in the news, of course, all the time. But they also, you also made headlines, right? Oh dear. Especially yeah. in the Bridgeport paper. Somebody told me, I, I never did get a copy of it. At the time, and this, is, this was what, 1960, one, I forget what year this was going on. Anyway, there was a kind of scandal sheet in Bridgeport, it was called the Bridgeport Herald. And somebody came to me and said, do you know the Bridgeport Herald has an article about you? I said, what? They said, the headline is, clergy spouse reveals boudoir secrets. 
I, I had admitted I had taken some birth control pills. That was my big scandal. <laughs> I wish now I had a copy of the newspaper article that I we need to find it. We need to find it. Well, <laughs> but what strikes me about that, though, is that you were also clergy. You'd been ordained. You were in the Church of Christ, ordained minister. So it exactly. wasn't just clergy. I mean, it wasn't you weren't you weren't only you were a clergy spouse, but you were also clergy in your own right. That's true. <laughs> I was still a lawbreaker, <laughs> <laughs> revealing your revealing your boudoir secrets. My boudoir secrets, exactly. So. It was a really interesting, um, really interesting experience. My only time in, in court that way. Right? <laughs> and not nearly as dramatic as, as I'd like to think it could be. <laughs> so Joan, yes. once that law was overturned and it made it to the US Supreme Court, yes. what kind of difference did it make, not only for you, but for your daughters and for the community you serve? Well, from then on, doctors could, you know, a woman getting ready to, to uh, get married or, or who wanted birth control could go to a doctor and have it prescribed and it was perfectly legal. And um, you didn't have to worry about the police or you didn't have to hide the fact that you were getting contraception. It was, um, it was legal just like getting medicine for the flu or, or for COVID, you know, all these things. <laughs> it was, it, there was medical help available. I, I can remember, and for me, there were, that was a stark change from the earlier days. I can remember back before it became legal, before the court case, before it was legal, and, and I, was at, on a, I was at Yale New Haven Hospital for, for a hospital visit for something, I forget what, and I remember being in a room with a white curtain between me and and. and on the other side and the doctor was talking to a woman on the other side of the curtain and saying to her mrs green mrs green i told you you must not get pregnant again you have many children and your body cannot take it anymore you must not get pregnant it, it will be very hard and it will be dangerous for you to have another pregnancy and think what it'll mean for your children and she said i know doctor i know you've told me that can you help me what can you do to help me and he said, I can't do anything to help me, to help you. The hospital isn't allowed to break the law. And it was so wrenching, you know, he, he wanted to be a good physician and be of help to the patient and the law said, no, can't do that. And so I was really glad when, once we tested the law and got rid of it, that it made it, you know, things better for people. Seems a long time ago, the 1960s. <laughs> Very long time ago. Yeah, but if if um, if the, those who wanted Roe v. Wade overturned, they're not. I mean, maybe some of them will stop with Roe v. Wade, but certainly okay. Clarence Thomas has said, "Yeah, we need to look at all the laws yeah. that are that are precedent or whatever." So. Yep, they start saying, well, okay, and then let's go after Griswold versus Connecticut. And I'm shouting at the TV set, no, 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 we did that once. We did. <laughs> it's really like, no, 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 that's insane. Um, but yeah, it's. Um, so how does it that turn? Me. <laughs> What's that? It concerns me, needless to say. Yeah. So, I mean, Roe v. Wade didn't didn't happen until later, um, seventy two. So it was ten years later. Ten years later, um, right? So, um, how? Do, I mean, once once Griswold v. Connecticut happened, did, did you still were you still involved in family planning for people? I ended up at that point because, um, as you said, there was no, um, there were there were no provision for abortion, and what came into being in, hmm, I'm not sure the date it started, but what came into being was a clergy counseling service for problem pregnancies, and maybe all of you have heard of that, went went on for a number of years, where clergy were trained to counsel women 
who felt they could not carry, the, found, who found themselves pregnant and found they could not, felt they could not carry the pregnancy through uh, to completion. Mm -hmm. um, it's the question you hear now all the time on the news, but there, so across the country, there were groups in every state of clergy who met together and, and were trained to do this kind of counseling. And I was part of a squad in the New Haven area that did that kind of, of counseling. In those days, the only places that we had to refer women for abortions were Japan, England, Puerto Rico. And over the several years that I was counseling, I had one young woman whose father did take her to Japan. I had one whose father took her to England and everybody else that I knew that went went to Puerto Rico to, to um, doctors who had been checked out by some staff from New York who had gone down and checked out and made arrangements. But that was very hard kind of counseling. And I, I don't want to see us have to go back to that again either. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. this, this is a good spot. If, if you have questions for Joan, please uh, share them in the chat. They'll go to Talitha and me and we'll kind of sort through them. So if you have specific questions about Joan's experience and perspective, feel free to send those to us. We just got a chat message from someone who grew up in Massachusetts and she said she got birth control from her mother's longtime female doctor who broke the law to do that. Mm -hmm. the doctors were taking a big risk at that time. Yep, yep. Yeah, I mean, it's sort of interesting to me where I, you know, I guess coming from Arizona, I always sort of thought of Massachusetts and Connecticut as being relatively liberal places, but <laughs> maybe right. they were on some issues, but certainly not on, on this issue. That's exactly other, right. Other questions? Any questions? <laughs> But Joan, I, I have a question for you as other people are typing them. Um, did, you talked about the clergy network that uh, formed in terms of Roe Ro v. Wade and access to abortion. When you challenged the law, did you get support from other colleagues or did you find yourself as a lone voice in the religious community? Um, at the time of the, the court case, yeah. I, I, don't, I don't remember any connections with anybody about that. Uh, I didn't, I guess I didn't look for any. I guess I didn't look to anybody for, um, or ask anybody's opinion. Um, Bob, my husband was very supportive. Um, and it wasn't kind of a, an issue that people were talking about. And that's a very interesting question that I haven't thought about before. It was very much a kind of an indiv individual thing until I got to the court and found the other two women who mm -hmm. parent had, had asked to be there. No. Right. Okay, I think there are some questions now. Brandon, did you? Talita, I, can, I can't see them on my screen. So I oh, think okay. have to. Okay, um, so one of the questions had was, or is, what about unmarried women, people who weren't married? That did did Griswold v. Connecticut that didn't address that issue, did it? Or how did that? Do you know? Um, no, I think that would have been a very no. It just said contraception was legal. Okay. I don't think it said for married people. I think it that's that would be interesting to go back and read. I just said contraception was legal, and um, right. And, and an interesting thing is, is that somebody also asked, um, when did other states allow contraception uh, or maybe what was the earliest? And I know just from having grown up in the West, actually some of the Western states, uh, California, Wyoming, <laughs> some places you wouldn't think of being necessarily, well, California, yes, but not Wyoming or Montana um, being being on the front of this kind of issue, but but many of the Western states were actually more um, allowed allowed contraception earlier than some of the the East Coast states. In the East, right? Yeah. And I'm not sure what that's about. I'm not sure why Connecticut, and Massachusetts were the last two holdouts. Well, some of it was. I let you know. For example, um, 
Wyoming was the first state to allow women to vote. And one of the reasons they did that <laughs> was because there are all these men out in Wyoming and they wanted women. <laughs> and so ah. they decided that one of the ways to get women to move to Wyoming was to give them the right to vote. Everybody. White women, okay, oh, just white right. women at that point. Good um, point, good point. Yeah. <laughs> so, that, so that I think that that was also some of the understanding behind contraception being allowed out in the wild west mm -hmm. um, because you know they wanted to, number one, women were working alongside men in a different kind of way, either in ranching or in farming. Um, and so there was this, yeah, there was a sense that it was okay, yeah, right. not across the board. I mean, certainly churches, evangelical Protestant and, and Catholic churches out in that part of the country, this part of the country also certainly have kept things difficult for a while. Uh -huh. um, another, um, it's not, somebody wrote, uh, Chandra wrote, not a question, but a thank you for standing up for the rest of us. As a woman and mother of three daughters, I feel like the fight must continue. The idea that we must stand strong and be vocal. Thank you to all of you. Thank you, Chandra, for that. Thank you. Thank yep, you. Absolutely. That's yep. a very nice response. Um, and then uh, Kwame Ose wrote, Joan, the Comstack who, and Kwame, you've got your law background as well as Divinity School, right? That's what I thought. Uh -huh. <laughs> law uh -huh. and grace. Got okay. the lawyer on me here. <laughs> That's right. He wrote, the Comstack law not only prohibited the use of contraceptives, oh, but also distributing information called obscene literature. Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah. And so Kwame was asking, do you know of clergy being arrested for sharing information on contraceptives? I don't know anything about that. It, it, it might have been possible, but yeah. I never heard of it. I never heard of that. Good point, though. Interesting. Yeah, really good. Yeah. That's right. To, to see how sort of self-centered I was. I don't care about what happened to the women. In this but <laughs> that's, right. uh, that's a very good question. Yeah. Yeah. But learn. can you imagine? I mean, you know, for any of us wanting to distribute material that you could be arrested for that as well. Thank you very much, Kwame, for yeah. uh, bringing that up. Um, Marie Fortune asked, did you have any UCC support? Was like the conference or the, the regional association or the national association involved with you guys at all? Um, they didn't know I was doing the court thing officially, I think, at all at that point. I, when it came to the um, clergy counseling for problem pregnancy, there was a lot of, maybe not official support, but lots and lots of UCC right. pastors and, right. and church support there. And we very often met in UCC church buildings around the New Haven area. So there was that. but. I don't didn't know of any interesting to think I didn't reach out for any support at the time of the birth control one. Mm -hmm. earlier. Right. right. Well, I mean, but you and Bob and the others in the group ministry were already doing sort of off the grid ministry. Yeah, you, weren't, right. <laughs> you weren't located in a local church doing sort of local church things. You were doing yeah. this odd ministry in the middle of New Haven. So, yeah. they probably, you know, this That's is just true. one more example of. Joan Forsberg being <laughs> off the grid. <laughs> off the grid. Exactly. Okay, um, Phil Kruger, who is also a lawyer, uh, wrote, Griswold's holding was not limited to married couples. And that, Joan, your memory is very much correct on that one. Um, okay, someone, and then Joan, I believe Snyder asked, uh, what do you see as the most effective actions we can take now to proactively address any efforts to overturn Griswold? Uh, about actions now? Hmm. I hate to tell you I haven't thought that far ahead because I don't want to think about having having it come to that in terms of <laughs> right. the gristle. It has. It has. I think, yeah. Yeah, yeah. right. That's a, that's a, it's a challenge. I know. I know. I, what I find myself... <laughs> anguishing or thinking about and trying to find creative ways of thinking and talking about in terms of all of these, both contraception and abortion questions is it takes two people to make a baby mm -hmm. and all the focus ends up being on the woman. Yeah. And hello, um, there needs to be some creative thinking about how to help this from another angle somehow. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. and I never hear anybody sort of talking about that. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, I try not to be vitriolic about it. I, um, I'm trying to think of creative ways to address the question so that people who are against contraception or who have really very judicial feelings about abortion could think differently about it if they could think about it from men's point of view as well, um, as well as just blaming women. And uh, mm -hmm. I'm working on that. I invite other people to work on that whole <laughs> angle too, to think about it. That's, that's a very good point. It does take, at least I'd always understood it takes two to tango. Yeah. So <laughs> that's a very medical term, tangoing. Okay, um, Kitty Janssen asks, says, coming from the Netherlands, she's from Holland, although she's here in Santa Fe right now. She and her husband are here in Santa Fe. Coming from the Netherlands while trying to find laws regarding contraception, she came across an article from 2019 about long-term contraception that was paid for by the government for women who had had an abortion and Ooh. to prevent repeat abortions. And in the Netherlands, there are about 30,000 abortions a year. One third of those were repeat abortions. Um, Dutch population is 17 million. It's quite a contrast. Yeah. In yeah. terms of not having the number of repeat ones. But what creative thinking. Mm -hmm. I like that. Yep. Yeah. Talk about planning ahead. Um, Very good. And then, okay, someone asked, Pam Homer asked, what, and goes, this is to your point, Joan, was male contraception, condoms, also illegal? Was sterilization illegal? In those days, everything, any kind of contraception was illegal. The thing was, you could buy condoms or jellies and stuff in the drugstore. You just couldn't use it when you got home, you know, <laughs> the law. They sold stuff, but, um, and of course, the only thing that was really most reliable would have been, would have been, uh, diaphragms and, and that involved doctors and that was really illegal but you know, other things could be bought and sold at the drugstore you just couldn't use it when you got home if you were married married or single <laughs> set it on your mantle or something the illogic <laughs> of all that was a bit much to me but that's right but there was also then the issue of and did the issue that uh, this person had also asked about sterilization but that was also something that was done against against uh, women of color african-american women native american women hispanic women yes. oh. um without their knowing about it without any knowledge of that yeah. and that certainly happened that's a brutal out here. chapter that's a brutal chapter in american history right. yes so in in having your neighbors which i always have struck i want to go back to before griswold versus the state of connecticut and the just underscore for me, Joan, as one of, as you know, as a student and hearing you share this story many decades ago in the last millennium, Brandon, <laughs> um, <laughs> what always struck me was that you didn't go, you, you didn't start proselytizing to your neighbors. You all need to go do this. Oh, heavens. They no. came to you and said, you know, can I, how, do, how are you doing this? Yeah. And uh, once they found out, then, you know, how can we be a part? I mean, how can we access this yeah. as well? And I just think that's a, such an important aspect of ministry or life or whatever of, you know, way that, that, that it was your neighbors who initiated the conversation, around oh, yes. it, not you coming in as the expert or whatever, um, saying you should all be doing this. Oh, heavens. No, it's way too personal. That's a very individual kind of thing. You never would tell anybody else that they ought to. Your kids maybe before they're of age, but you know. yeah, I mean, but you're <laughs> but, uh, no. you're right to do that. <laughs> but um, no, 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 I never ever opened my mouth to anybody unless they asked. If they asked me, I would share what helpful I knew. But other than that, no, no, mm -hmm. it was uh, right. Yeah. So so yeah. Did but did the issue of of forced sterilization ever enter into this conversation? Because, because I mean, so you've got the laws on the book, the Comstock laws, Comstock laws saying contraception is illegal, but you also have state governments, hospitals, uh, you know, city hospitals, whatever, sterilizing young women 
because they were poor or because they were black or because they were Hispanic or because they were Navajo or Diné or whatever. Um, was that was that a part of the conversation at that time at all? Not that I was part of. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And whether that was blindness or ignorance on my part or self-absorption, I was sort of, well, it, that uh, wasn't at that time. I became aware right. later of those issues, yeah. Um, well, and it wasn't always widely known. I mean, it's uh, only right. been, yeah. it's only been in more recent years that some of that has come to the light. Come to light. The, right, become known. Um, somebody also wrote, uh, back to the, to the questions or comments, somebody also wrote, um, Earlier this week, I saw a bumper sticker that read, vasectomy prevents abortion. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> it's an interesting, interesting way of doing it. Other, I think I got everybody's, all the chats. Oh, um, Judy Davis from YDS asked, um, were any Episcopal clergy supportive at that time that you remember? Or <laughs> were there Episcopal clergy either involved in the uh, uh, Griswold v. Connecticut supporting you in that or in the clergy, um, concerned clergy um, counseling? There were uh, in the clergy counseling for problem pregnancies, yes, there were lots of Episcopal clergy, all, all denominations seem to be. I don't remember any um, in the around the time of the Griswold thing because it, it wasn't a church. Mm -hmm. Well, it was when people were going to Hartford to. to Right. Um, to testify, and those I only the ones I knew who went to testify were congregational mm -hmm. UCC, maybe right. Methodist ones, but I didn't. There might have been others. Mm -hmm. I don't know beyond that. Right. Okay. Um, someone else asked. Um, I think you may have already answered this, but did after Griswold v. Connecticut happened, did you have? I know that you've been you were doing the problem pregnancy counseling, but did. Women, uh, young women come to you for guidance in terms of contraception and family planning and that sort of thing? Um, no, I didn't have a shingle out for anything. And, you know, mm -hmm. women in, in women's groups at this school, thing, we would sometimes talk about such things, but mm -hmm. it wasn't. Um, It wasn't something that people sought you out for in the same kind of way. Yeah, no. Yeah, it was I, a different yeah, kind of thing, I, yeah. Uh, someone wrote, interestingly, interestingly, Clarence Thomas, a Catholic, has only one child from his first marriage. <laughs> That's an interesting uh, question. Uh, and then someone else wrote, my oldest son and his wife decided they didn't want children. So he got a, he got a vasectomy rather than it being her responsibility mm -hmm. to, prevent the, to prevent the pregnancy. Right. So. No, there are many okay. who think ahead that way, right? Any other, Brandon, why don't you weigh in on some of this? I'm sorry, the chat function wasn't working for you, so. Sure, sure. I, Joan, as you watch things unfold, you've touched on this a little bit, I think. The news is so heart-wrenching. Where, where do you see hope in the movement today for reproductive justice and access to healthcare and all, all the services one needs? Do you see moments of hope or clarity Well, there, you know, you hear of spasmodic things around the country of people um, trying to provide access for health care for women who can't, you know, in particular abortion health care. Now, it depends where you come down on the issue of abortion. But for many women, it's a real health issue or um, it's not a frivolous issue. And so, and there are lots of, I see lots of signs of hope of people coming to including what I heard yesterday of somebody talking about a ship off, off, you know, out in the waters outside the country of one way of being outside of the state limits or something. People are doing it. Um, I'm hoping, you know, I'm not in a youthful, <laughs> I'm not in a youthful community where people talk about um, these things as much. Um, being in a retirement community, but I'm hoping people are reflecting thoughtfully about this and trying to find ways to be more positive into the future. And, and blaming is not helpful, you know, guilt, mm -hmm. guilt stuff is not helpful. Um, 
And there may well, I don't know if anybody's dealing with this in seminaries with it, or counseling courses about how to be hmm. helpful without being heavy handed. I'm hope, I hope I would be hopeful, but I don't know. I don't know. I'm a little out of the age league at this point <laughs> of worrying about reproductive health um, somehow. Yeah. But, uh, Okay, the, any the news always interests me just because of the because of the history, you know. Right, right. Absolutely. Okay, any other questions or comments to share? Uh, someone wrote uh, the economics might turn the tide. That could also be, yeah, if certain Good states point. the economics, yeah. I mean that's that's how the Martin Luther King holiday happened. <laughs> <laughs> at, least, at least, at least how it passed in Arizona. Finally, was you know people were boycotting. So uh -huh. yeah, it'll be interesting to see what happens. Interesting. So, All right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so okay, uh, Brandon. Any last thoughts or words or? Uh, thank you, Joan, and thank you, Talitha. I think this is an important conversation that I hope communities of faith and non-religious people are having. But Joan, thanks. Thanks for your dedication and your willingness to talk about it. Oh, you're very welcome. It's a delight to see old friends and new friends. Um, uh, Joan? Yes. Joan, I, uh, I don't know if you remember, but the Connecticut uh, uh, Public um, Television put together a program called The Roots of Row. Oh, yes. Long time. And um, I've used that for years with my students. You're interviewed a number of times in that. And, um, and I would just suggest for, uh, be, because it, it takes the whole Griswold discussion and moves it into the whole area. I forgot that. Thank you for reminding me of that. If you, if you could find it, it's out of print. And I've been, we, we have a very old VHS tape at the university. <laughs> Which is um, is losing its life quite quickly. Right. It's a it's a marvelous, marvelous piece to use as part of education, and especially now, given what's happened with Dobbs. But yes. thank you, Joan. Thank you for for for, for knowing you and for for, uh, for the work that you've done over time. Oh, thank you, and thank you for that suggestion. I I had totally forgotten about that. That'd be fun to follow up on and see if somebody could find a good copy of it and get some. Yep. renewed or something so yeah absolutely that'd be great yeah very good very so good. one last question and i'm not sure um joan if if this is one that you can answer or um but just a, it's an interesting question from yeah, right. margaret who lives in oklahoma do you think states like oklahoma that are now putting other laws in place like a doctor's breaking the law other outsiders reporting women who go out of state or others who help them uh, be help being help them be prosecuted. How far do you think um, these laws will affect all women? Is that I mean, and that's an interesting question, not only for Joan, but I think for all of us. That there's some there's some pretty draconian laws that are getting passed in various that's states. For sure, that's yeah. a scary yeah. thought to yeah. contemplate. <laughs> it is a very scary thought to contemplate. Yeah, I mean. One of the issues here in, in New Mexico is that Planned Parenthood from Texas has left, the, at least one clinic has left Texas and moved to uh, Las Cruces down in the southern part of the state. Uh -huh. So it's, um, yeah, it's a very, uh, I mean, it used to be that you went living in the Southwest, people went to Mexico for abor abortions. Um, but now it may be that people come to New Mexico uh -huh. or go to California. What about in Brandon? What about in California? Are you seeing? I mean, are people sort of banding together to offer um, abortion care there and that sort of thing? Yeah, the, when you hear from Planned Parenthood or organizers, it's about building travel funds to to allow people to travel to the state of California. Don't because we're well aware that that because of our politics, I mean, there is that subtle fear of what might happen next, but. But at, at this point, getting people to the state and facilitating that, whether it's financially or providing hosts, that's, that's the conversation. And that's the plea from, from organizers is donate to those travel funds because surely women will need to access them sooner rather than later. Mm -hmm. Right. 
Good point. Good point. Yes. Yep. Okay. Interesting times. <laughs> yes. Yes. Just when we thought, just when we thought it was safe to go back in the water. <laughs> that's why, that's why I always told Brandon that one of my favorite movies I watch it once a year is Jaws. You know, you, you think you're home free, but you ain't. So anyway. All right. Well, we're, I know it's a it's a, been a long day for those of you in Eastern time, and it's been a long day for clergy in California time. <laughs> Joan, we're so glad. We thank you so much for being a part of for your witness of several decades ago and also for for being being who you are now and continuing to bear witness. So um, it's been great to have you. Thank you. And we really appreciate it very, very much. So thank you. Thank you, thank you, so, you so much. much. All right. Good, to see you. Wave. good night and uh, good night and good luck, as they say. <laughs> You're right. Well, good to see you all. Right. Good to see you all. That's right. Thank you so much. Yep. Good to see you, Margaret, as well. So thank you. Yes. yes. All right. Oh, let's see. Okay. Yeah. Now let's see how we get out of here. Thanks, Talitha. Thanks, sure. Joan. Thank you. Sure. Joan, Thank you. Yes, indeed. Yep. Thank you all. There we go. I'm gonna... All right.